Hey everybody, Dr. G here. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and body language expert, and today we're going to be analyzing Jodan von der Schlut. Von der Schlut has confessed to the murder of two women, Natalie Holloway in 2005 and Tatiana Flores Ramirez in 2010. He's currently serving a 28-year prison sentence for the murder of Tatiana Flores Ramirez in Peru. Currently, he's being extradited to the United States over wire fraud and extortion. He told Natalie Holloway's mother that if she gave him $25,000, he would tell her the location of Natalie Holloway's body, a truly despicable act by a truly despicable person. What we're going to talk about today are some of the ways that he's a psychopath, and then we're going to do a body language analysis. One last thing I do want to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right, let's go. Before we get started, I want to go over six different ways that he has demonstrated characteristics of a psychopath. Just because he shows one of these doesn't mean he's a psychopath. What I want you to see is the greater picture. I want you to see all of these together. The first one is impulsivity and risk-taking. If you look at his history of gambling and the behaviors he talked about on the night of Natalie Holloway's disappearance, he does have a history of risk-taking and impulsivity. Lack of remorse and guilt. He has demonstrated no remorse or guilt for all the lies he's told, the pain he's put the Holloways through, or any of the fake confessions that he's given. Pathological lying. This is a trait that's commonly seen in psychopaths. They have no problem lying, and he lies like he breathes. He has lied about many things publicly, and has no problem later on recanting it and just saying, no, that's not true. His lying is one of the highlights of his psychopathy. His ability to lie and the extent of his lies and the nature of his lies is extreme. Manipulative behavior. This is something we see almost universally from psychopaths. It's something that we've seen in an extreme form with him. Thinking about him telling Natalie Holloway's mother that he would reveal the location of the body if she paid him, I mean, aside from the fact that it's criminal, is unbelievably manipulative and awful. Criminal versatility. We oftentimes see this in psychopaths. Not only is he capable of murder, he also has no problem with extortion or any other types of illegal behavior. And a lack of empathy, which really weaves into all of the examples I've given whether it be murder, whether it be telling somebody's mother that they know the location of the body, whether it's lying to everybody, whether it's manipulating people for money, he has an unbelievable lack of empathy that is profound. And this is very consistent with what we see with psychopaths. Now let's look at an interview from 2008. In this interview, Van der Schlut is telling Greta Van Susteren that Natalie Holloway was in fact sold into slavery. And we're going to watch as he talks about this and see what his body language tells us about his lies. Maybe I should ask you, what do you ultimately want out of this? Uh, I guess for just all to be over, for just, yeah, that's it, just for me to be able. Now, one thing I want you to pay close attention to is his eyes. Now, as I've talked about before, the direction people look is basically meaningless. You can't read too much into that. There's no good research that suggests that the direction you're looking means anything. So don't pay attention to that. What I want you to pay attention to is the rate that he blinks. Something we know as psychopaths is they do tend to blink less than most people. It's almost a predatory stance, but watch his eyes. Able to get on with everything and feel okay. That's what I ultimately want out of it. And I know if you guys look into this, that you're going to find out. I think with definitely with everything I gave, if you really go and look into it, you're going to find stumble across something that will get you more answers. I'm sure about it. I know it. As you can see, he looks a little bit less comfortable at the very end there. We're going to go back and review it, but I'm going to explain why, because basically. Body language is connected to our limbic system. It's involuntary. It just happens. So usually when people lie, they feel uncomfortable. Most of us feel uncomfortable when we lie. He clearly has no problem lying, but that doesn't mean that occasionally certain lies or certain ways that he might be challenged might cause him to show some more body language. It might cause him to feel a little bit of discomfort. Most people telling these kind of lies would be showing all sorts of discomfort. He shows very little, but he does show some. So let's go back and see why he started blinking more, why he acted a little different. If I stumble across something that will get you more answers, I'm sure about it. I know it. Were there conversations on this chip? Yeah, three separate conversations. When did they occur and w with whom were the conversations? Uh, they occurred uh, about a month ago, I think. Maybe longer, two months ago, longer. If you're watching, I talked about him blinking. He is not blinking pretty much at all. I mean, he does blink some as, as we continue to go on but his rate of blinking is very slow. It's very reminiscent of Brian Koberger, actually. And while he hasn't stood trial yet, we've seen him in some hearings. And when he stares, his eyes are wide open and he blinks very little. We're seeing something very similar from him. And I also want you to keep in mind, when he's talking to Greta Van Susteren, he is staring straight through her. His eyes are locked on her. They occasionally deviate, but it's very rare. And it's not socially appropriate. He's really more staring than he is being polite and speaking or making good eye contact. And, uh... 
Yeah, about actually about the person that the conversation is with. I don't actually really want to talk about, <laughs> but. Um... And so this is uncomfortable laughter. This is him trying to soothe himself a little bit. So like I said, he's a good liar, but it doesn't change the fact that he's got some tells. Now, sometimes people feel uncomfortable laughter in general, but this seems to be that this is a little bit harder of a lie because it is very consequential. I actually really want to talk about, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's just, uh, I was just giving that to you for, you know, to collaborate as. This has been one of the very few times that he's been willing to break staring at her. Now, where people gaze, like I said, tends not to matter a whole lot as in like if you look in the top left, it means you're accessing this memory or that memory or whatever. All that's nonsense. But when he's breaking his gaze, it's because this lie is so big and so bold and he knows they're not going to be able to corroborate this information. And for a second, he's able to break his gaze from her because this one might, makes him very uncomfortable. Let's go back and watch him say this again. Yeah, that's just, uh, I was just giving that to you for, you know, to collaborate as the... Uh, you know, it to continue to investigate the story. I've got to have it really straight and nailed down. Mm -hmm. And you have told us now something um, that's very different from what we understood to have happened. All right, now you're seeing him blink a lot. Not because of the lies. What we're seeing him blink a lot for is because Greta Van Susteren is, putting, is sticking it to him, and I think that he has a problem with women. And so I think that when you have a woman being confrontational and he has no power in the situation, that's very upsetting for him. So he's trying to soothe himself by blinking. He is feeling stressed right now, and so he is blinking. But it's not because he's being caught in a lie. It's because he's being challenged. Let's listen to the way she talks to him and watch this again. Let's investigate this story. I've got to have it really straight and nailed down. Mm -hmm. And you have told us now something um, that's very different from what we understood to have happened. And from, from the chip, it's a that there's a conversation with your father recorded. Um, actually, there are three conversations with your father recorded, right? There's three conversations. Um, one was in January, about? They were... So the lip licking, once again, that's a soothing behavior. So as he's talking about this, he's calming himself down. And the more he gets used to lying, the more he can continue to do it. So he's going to get in his groove and be able to lie more easily, but it takes a couple of minutes for him to get there. Where did you meet this guy? The casinos in Aruba. What's his name? Um, Elher, and yeah, but I don't, know if it's, I don't even know if it's his real name. That's the problem. I don't even know if it's his uh, real name. I wasn't worried about that at the time. It was just... Uh... So this is interesting. There's some of the subtle body language that's consistent with when somebody is reacting to an actual emotion. I'll explain what that is in a second. But what I want you to keep in mind that this is a verifiable lie. He has since explained that this is a hoax, that there was not somebody that he basically sold Natalie into slavery for, somebody that he met that was looking for a blonde girl. So all of this is a lie. Let's go back and look at some of the body language we're seeing. Elher, and yeah, but I don't, know if it's, I don't even know if it's his real name. So oftentimes when we see eyebrows raised, that's a look of surprise. What this says is that this is a lie that he's thought about before. Something maybe it's based on real people or real situations or something that he can think back on and feel about when he's talking about it. Because oftentimes when he speaks, he's very flat. He doesn't move much, which is something we often see with liars or people that are trying to be deceptive. But during this, he's a little bit more animated and we know it's a lie. So to me, that says this is a practiced lie. This is something he had thought through in a great detail because he's reaching into his memory and talking about things he has thought about. He's not making this up as we go. That's the problem. I don't even know if it's his uh, real name. I wasn't worried about that at the time. It was just uh, more like casino going, having fun there. And he's one of the persons I saw there. I didn't hang out with him. I didn't do anything with him. What, did you only see him one time in February? No, no, more times, like two times or three times. Or I've seen him over a period of one and a half years or something. Is he in a Reuben? I don't know. I can't. I don't because during this sequence, like I said, he's a little bit more animated. He's showing a little bit more. So what I believe is that as he's talking about this, he's probably basing it on a real person. Like we know, the situation's not real, but I imagine he's thinking of an actual person he has seen and met before. He offered me money. And what did you say? I said, okay, sure. And so February of 05, you have this conversation with him in the casino and um, between February of 05 and about May 30th, 05. Did you see him at all? Yeah, yeah, before that. He was, like, before he was telling me, like, uh, he was just acting like a, like a high roller in there and uh, spending. 
visualization can be a very powerful thing. Visualizing things and having a mental image can be very, very powerful. So when you're making up lies, if you have very concrete, vivid images of the person you're lying about, it's much easier to lie about it because you have some point of reference that you can explain. When you're starting to talk about situations they've done, that's a lot less concrete. So the lies get a little bit harder to tell. The subtleties, the little parts of the lies start to spill through with the emotions because the anxiety starts to pick up when you're having to make something up. Before that, he was like before he was telling me like uh, he was just acting like a like a high roller in there and uh, spending money like like it was nothing on blackjack and. All right, he was acting like he was a high roller, spending money like it was nothing on blackjack. These are fantasies that would be very, very appealing to psychopaths. It might be appealing to other people as well, but this is the kind of character that he's going to create because this is who he would want to be. So he's probably describing aspects of himself as he talks about this. And then uh, he was always talking about going out, going stuff. I know he, he, he goes from Venezuela to Aruba and all that. That's what he was telling me at least. And uh, yeah. Did he ever say what he wanted a blonde girl for? No. Did you have any sort of guess what it was? I mean, were you, was it sort of the, the code, you know, you speak in code, you sort of knew what he wanted? No, no, I wasn't, wasn't really uh, occupied with that at all. One of the challenges with psychopaths is that they don't move much. As we've talked about before, the, the center, center of the brain that deals with anxiety is underactive for psychopaths. That's why they can do the awful things that they do. And he doesn't have much of a connection with his emotions. That's why we have to look for such subtle things and why he's able to sit so still. Most people have naturally a little bit more body movement. Well, he's talking about going out, going stuff. I know he, he, he goes from Venezuela to Aruba and all that. That's what he was telling me at least. This, this is why at times he can be an effective liar because he provides extra things to color what he's talking about. Like saying, he does this, or at least that's what he tells me. That's the kind of detail people provide in actual conversations, and so by liars doing that, our unconscious mind is more likely to believe them. Guess what it was. I mean, were you, was it sort of the, the code, you know, you speak in code, you sort of knew what he wanted? No. No, I wasn't, wasn't really uh, occupied with that at all. I had school going, and I had other things, I had friends, I wasn't really... Uh... Also, by including details that were actually true, that maybe he had school going around that time and friends and whatnot, once again, that kind of color helps lies seem more believable. Like, I mean, like, I wasn't even concerned about his name, to tell you the truth. Did he offer you any money? Yeah. I have a specific number. Yeah, he offered me money. What was the number? I don't really want to say, but he offered me money for it. So he doesn't want to say because lying about something that concrete and that specific is harder to do. You get a little bit more anxious when you're lying about those kinds of things. Give me money for it. Well, yeah, I mean, come on. I mean, you, look, we've come halfway across the world. You know, you want, this is what you've told us, Ron, that you, that, you know, you okay. want this investigated because everybody seems to think something. All right, so now he's licking his lips. This is making him anxious. He does not like the way that she's speaking to him. It feels confrontational. And I think that because it's a woman, it probably makes it worse for him. Happen. That's why you contacted contact me. At least that's what you told me, is that you want that. If I get that information, um, we can track it down. Yeah. Um, so that's why I need to pull these facts out of it because that... As you can see, he's blinking a lot more now. He's got small tells when he's feeling stressed or anxious. Occasional lip licking, occasional blinking, because we know when he's not stressed and when he's less anxious or when he is not feeling concerned, he stares and he's predatorial in the way that he looks. But right now he's blinking a lot. Check this out. Um, we can track it down. Yeah. Um, so that's why I need to pull these facts out of it because that will corroborate the chip and will help me in the investigation. Okay, well, you only gave me $10,000. Okay, no, but that's later. But during between February and May, did he ask you, did he talk money with you on a specific number? Uh -huh. And then where did you go? Then I, uh, first I went to the Radisson. And talked to him? Um, yeah, and I played a little poker there. And then I went to... Uh... Once again, check out the blinking. He's starting to blink a lot more. Now, not everybody blinks this much when they're feeling stressed, but because he's able to hold the rest of his face so solid and so still, that's his tell. Just go back and look at this again. I know you've seen it already once, but I just want you to watch again. Um, yeah, and I played a little poker there. And then I went to, uh, then I called a friend of mine who didn't pick up his phone. And then I called uh, other friends of mine, asked them if they wanted to go out. And so something we're starting to see very consistently, if you've watched my other videos on psychopaths, is that the eyes tell a lot. Because 
we know that we can manipulate people by controlling what we do with our face. We can't always control. Sometimes smiles happen, frowns, anger, sadness, all of that stuff. We show, we leak out emotions sometimes, but the eyes are much harder to control when you're controlling the rest of the face. So we see very consistently through different psychopaths, Chris Watts, Ted Bundy, lots of different folks like that, that if you watch the eyes, if nothing else is showing, the eyes will show you something. It was uh, at the ev evening, okay. evening. You go home, um, and uh, what, what do you do when you get home? Uh, went on the, took a shower, went on the internet. Uh. Now this is the single biggest sign of stress that he has shown so far. When people, when they blow out with puffed cheeks, that is a very consistent indicator of stress. And look, he looks at the camera and then puffs his cheeks out because there's something about what he did that night about going home, whatever she's asking about at this very moment that is incredibly consequential. Go back and look at this again. Um, and uh, what, what do you do when you get home? Uh, he even looked at the camera. So there was something very unusual about what did you do when you got home? So I don't know if that's when he killed Natalie Holloway. I'm not sure what, uh, what it is that's so significant about this, but there is something that's very significant. Went on the, took a shower, went on the internet. Uh... And another sign of stress. This is showing one large sign of stress after another. And I wasn't even sure if I still wanted to go out or not because I actually had school the next day. And then, uh, yeah, then Deepa called me like, uh, okay, we're, uh, we're going to come with you. There's something about the question she asked that I think connected with a memory of his. Maybe about the murder itself, maybe about something he did, but he became very animated. Let's watch that whole sequence again, because with what he's saying and the context of all the lies he's told, there's something really unusual about the fact that this was so stressful for him. Home, um, and uh, what, what do you do when you get home? Uh, went on the, took a shower, went on the internet. Uh, and I wasn't even sure if I still wanted to go out or not. And then, uh, yeah, then Deepa called me like, uh, okay, we're, uh, we're gonna come with you. We're ready, on my way now. Because I knew Charles closed at 12, 12 o'clock too that night. So, uh, it, I, so back to this lie, he's starting to get calmer again. It was like 11 o'clock when we went. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, and the rest of the story is just like, like we told it, except for the end of it. So on this channel, we look at lots of different types of manipulators, lots of different types of psychopaths. He's one that chronically lies. Now there's plenty that manipulate and there's plenty that lie, but he goes for big lies and he will lie about the same thing and then recant it and lie about something else and recant it. And he is a compulsive, constant, pathological liar. And so what you gotta understand about people like him is that they are pretty good at lying. There's, we can see through it a little bit, but he also knows how to craft a lie. He knows the kinds of details to include so they can be convincing. So as he gets fully extradited back here in the US, I will definitely be doing more analyses if it warrants it. I hope that this was something that you learned something from and that you learned more about pathological liars and how they operate. A couple of quick things before we finish up. One, I wanted to make sure you knew about my body language course that's going to be coming soon. I got an announcement that's coming in a couple of weeks. I'm also going to be doing a live Q&A around June 15th. I will let you know for sure what day that is as soon as I can. I also wanted to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right. Thanks for watching.